On this edition of Oliver North's America, Jeremy Hunt took an oath to defend the Constitution from all enemies, foreign and domestic, from the U.S. Army to Yale Law School. Welcome to this edition of My America. I'm Oliver North. Our guest today, Jeremy Hunt. He's a Georgia native and a graduate of the United States Military Academy at West Point. I know that place pretty well. In 2019, Jeremy was promoted to captain and served at a military intelligence base in Arizona. After serving five years of active duty as a U.S. Army officer, he's now a first-year student at Yale Law School. Jeremy's authored thought-provoking commentary on race relations and other important issues. His works appeared in the Washington Compost, New York Post, and foxnews.com, and The Hill. He's also a frequent contributor on Fox News Channel. Jeremy most enjoys spending time with his wife and one-year-old daughter in New Haven, Connecticut. Welcome to the show. Thank you for having me. It's an honor to, to join you. I've, I've seen you on Fox, and I admire your, your ability to, to level just the playing field that the mainstream media won't let, often let happen. So let's, let's talk about some of these big Thank issues you. right now. How is your perspective on big tech affecting the way young people see the world, young people like you? I'm a geezer. <laughs> well, you know, it, I'll tell you right now, it really is kind of changing the whole landscape that young people are, are being brought up in right now. Um, I mean, it, when you look at how much influence we, uh, the, our phones have over our lives, we're constantly scrolling and kind of getting these different little uh, sound bites. Uh, exactly. I mean, kind of getting these little sound bites instead of the whole picture. And so unfortunately, we're getting our news from, you know, these, these little kind of snippets, what you see on Twitter or, or on uh, Instagram, whatever, social media. And so I definitely think that it's having a, a role in kind of showing us kind of what big tech wants us to see. I mean, and, and so unfortunately, I, some views that we, it's harder to kind of escape our own echo chambers. And I think that's something that's really kind of uh, uh, dangerous moving forward, because for us to really move forward as a country, it takes all of us kind of willing to listen to the other side and, and engage new ideas. And unfortunately, we just aren't, aren't getting that as much anymore. Look, you're, you're a law student at a very prestigious law school. What, what, are, the, what are your profs and, and, your, and your classmates saying about things like, if you will, the cancel culture? If you will, the kinds of things where the publishers of America united that if you worked in the Trump administration, you're not going to get published. What do they think about that in terms of the laws yeah. that do we need to change the laws to protect people from our my First Amendment and your Second Amendment and all the rest of our rights in that Bill of Rights? Well, yeah, I mean, it's, there's no secret that cancel culture is no doubt uh, just kind of uh, taking over I mean, in a real way. I mean, it's, it's, it, it really kind of comes from a place of hubris. It, it, it's a place of that I, you know, the, the left thinks that because we are so much more enlightened and so smarter than you, uh, that uh, only our ideas are the ones that ought to be shared. And so if you think any differently from me, then you don't even deserve to have a platform at all. And so that's kind of the new narrative. So it, where it used to be that, you know, we have different views and we can engage and debate and discuss those things. I mean, this is a, a democracy after all. Um, now it is entirely different. Now the view is, is that I, you know, I'm going to speak my views, but you don't get to say yours. And, and I want to make sure I silence any op opposing views instead of engaging them. So it's, it's really intellectually lazy, it's, it's, it's dishonest, um, and it's not going to lead to a productive future, uh, especially in the world of politics uh, for our country. You're, look, you, I guess you're classified by age as a millennial. I'm, I'm, a, I'm a geezer, right? But I look, at, <laughs> I, I look at some trends that seem to be happening. Now, I've got 18 grandkids, some of whom are in college and some of whom are in diapers, okay? And I look at What's going on right now is marriage rates are dropping. Millennials are giving birth to fewer children than ever before. There's a lot more of them living together but not having kids. Is this a long-term problem? And if so, I believe it is. How do we fix this? Yeah, I mean, you're exactly right. We seem to kind of, we're entering an era um, where people in my generation, yeah, we're not, we're not, uh, you know, getting married, having kids, uh, buying a home as quickly as generations before us. And I, I would point to a, a couple things. One, um, uh, just 
in terms of policy, uh, we right now it's very expensive to buy a home. Um, we don't have the means to. A lot of us are encumbered by a lot of student debt. Uh, so things like that are just kind of natural barriers right now to, to kind of getting started with, with our uh, careers and also with starting a family. Uh, but I also think there's some cultural issues. I mean, we, we are now kind of in a place where the family uh, is not really celebrated as, you know, uh, as self-fulfilling in and of itself. Um, you know, that we're, we're told from an early age to find fulfillment only in our career and only in the things that, you know, that, that, that uh, the, the market can provide us. But I actually think that we have to kind of almost renew the way we talk about family and talk about how important and, and, and how um, how much you learn from being a father and a wife and and and, and for being a, a, a um, you know parents. So for me right now, I am just living a dream. Uh, so I'm obviously in law school, but I also married with a, a little girl. She's one and a half year old, uh, year a year old, and and she just lights up my world every day, and I, it's. It's wonderful to kind of get time to, to spend with her even while going through law school. And it, there's nothing more fulfilling than being a husband and a father. Uh, and, I, and I wish that more people could kind of celebrate this. And I, and I think that we have to do our job, uh, especially those of us that have kids and have families, to celebrate the family and talk about the fruits of, of, of having children and the fruits of, of going through and, and having a, a wonderful marriage. I think that's a, an important part. So there's a cultural piece, but there's also a policy piece, having more pro-family uh, legislation. I mean, we had to, we had to, ha we had to uh, make it easier for people to have families and kind of reduce some of those barriers to getting started. Well, I will tell you, it's great being a husband and father. And I'm, I've been a husband of one for 53 years. I've got the father of four, grandfather of 18, and there's nothing better than a grandkid. Trust me, <laughs> I know, okay? I mean, it's, I bet. all the rest of it's wonderful, but that's the most satisfying part of my now 77 years on this life. Look at uh, the, the Biden administration's uh, efforts right now. As graduates of service academies, we both know we took an oath to support and defend the Constitution of the United States. And yet there's an effort now to turn the military into a social justice organization. And I, you know, I, I joked about this with Tucker. I said, what, what the left is trying to tell you is it's time for you that you woke up in the, in the terminology of the day. What, what's, what's going on in the Pentagon that makes this sound like a good idea because it doesn't improve military readiness a bit. Yeah, I mean, it was almost night and day when the when the Biden administration took over. Uh, now, what we're seeing is I call it the, the Biden bait and switch. Basically, what they're doing is they are they're baiting in Americans by saying, listen, you know, our only goal is to stamp out extremism. And I think a lot of great Americans are saying, yeah, that, that's a good idea. You know, I don't, I don't sure. like extremism. That's a good thing to get. Let's get rid of it. Um, but then they switch, and then they they redefine what, it, what what extremism means. Literally, right now, they're actually redefining what it means. Uh, and and so what they and, and what they really want to do is kind of make sure that even conservative voices as a whole, any any kind of conservative voice, now is it is it that conservative voices are now redefined as extremists. So you see how that works, is that we used to have kind of a, a, a common understanding of what extremism meant, uh, but now there seems to be this kind of renewed efforts to redefine what that means. And so, you know, and, and so that's the problem, I think, that we're, we're seeing going forward is that we're kind of losing a common understanding of what terms like extremism and racism, what those mean. I mean, you know, when I hear the term racism, it, it invokes imagery of the 60s and, and, and you know, yeah. horrible images. Uh, but now we see that term just floated casually. I mean, it, it, anything could be classified as racism these days. Uh, and it really does a disservice to the, the civil rights movement that came before us and, uh, and, and just for even anyone who has a, a heart for justice nowadays, um, it, it's really problematic. When you finish law school, what, what do you want to do? I'm still figuring that out right now. I'm just trying to get through my, my first year, uh, but I'm, I'm hoping uh, you know at some point to continue to use my law degree to, to fight, uh, to, to help our help our country and to uh, defend our democracy. Those are things that are the most important to me. And so I, I look forward to continuing that work uh, as a lawyer. Are any of your other classmates veterans? 
we have a, a small contingency. Um, there are, I think there's maybe uh, eight or nine uh, other veterans in my class. Um, and we are actually the biggest class of veterans at Yale Law uh, in, in recent history, um, and uh, which, which is funny. But, it, you know, we, we are really, um, you know, a great group uh, of veterans that, that have served and now are, are at law school. Very, you know, there's also intellectual diversity among us. You know, we don't all think the same, but we, we have great discussions. And, you know, it's, it's been a, a great community here. Jamie, thank you for being with us today and providing facts that our fellow Americans can use in these very challenging times. Thank you. I appreciate it. This is an honor. Friends, if this broadcast has been informative, helpful, or encouraging, take time now to subscribe or comment and let me know. By doing so, you too can become part of this historical record of how America persevered in a pandemic and once again prospered. Until next time, remember, Semper Fidelis is more than a slogan for U.S. Marines. Always faithful is a way of life.